Hello there. My name is Janie, and this is the story of Apollo and Hyacinthus. Before I even begin, I am definitely not an expert in Greek mythology, but I am a storyteller. I tend to take different sources that I read, that I research <laughs> on Google. I don't know if you can call that research, but it's definitely a lot of late night scrolling. And I also watch YouTube videos and listen to others who are experts talk. And I tend to combine all of the little details that I think are most interesting, those little nuggets that stick in my brain. And I combine them into a story that I like to tell. So this is my disclaimer that if you are somebody who is researching for possibly a school project, I would not start and stop with this particular video. I would maybe use this as my jumping off point to become obsessed with Greek mythology to actually go and read these. This particular myth I know for sure you can find in the Orphic Hymns as well as some other sources in Greek mythology. And there are lots of sources out there for you to look up, including YouTube videos like this one podcasts. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. So I always like to not start with Apollo meeting Hyacinthus, but I love to start with Apollo and his bad luck in love in general. When Apollo was born, it was actually in pretty traumatic circumstances. Of course, there's not a lot of circumstances in Greek mythology that is not traumatic, but Leto, Apollo's mother, was having an affair with Zeus. And of course, when she got pregnant and Hera found out, Leto and her two babies inside her belly were in some pretty big trouble. Hera decided to punish Leto for the affair by telling her that she was forbidden, forbidden, from giving birth anywhere not attached or anywhere attached to land or to the sky. And that basically meant she could not deliver those babies at all if she was on the ground or in Olympus. And so Leto was forced to wander and eventually she started getting labor pains and they were terrible, they were awful. But she was unable to give birth. Ooh, sorry. The goddess of childbirth would not come to her because Hera had forbade it. And so Poseidon ended up coming to Leto one day and saying, don't worry, I found a place that technically does not break Hera's rules. It is an island floating on the sea. And so it is not attached to land and it is not attached to sky. And Leto traveled there after nine days of labor pains and she gave birth to the baby in her belly. She thought there was only one and she assumed it was a boy. And lo and behold, Artemis pops out. And she thought, wow, I'm having a girl. And then immediately the labor pain started up again. And Artemis actually helped deliver her brother Apollo. I guess the Greek gods come out looking like, or acting like baby giraffes, how they're already kind of walking around and capable. <laughs> After she gave birth, however, Hera's wrath was not over. In fact, Hera was pretty pissed that Leto was able to give birth at all, and now Zeus had these illegitimate children out and about. So Hera sent a large python to murder Leto and the babies. Or, you know, honestly, one or the other. If Leto could suffer by losing her children, Hera would have been fine with that. If Zeus could suffer by losing Leto, Hera would have been fine with that. She was a woman scorned. You might be asking yourself, why didn't Hera ever take this out on Zeus? This wasn't the women's fault. And you're right, but Hera had actually been forced to make an unbreakable oath to never try to overthrow Zeus and never do anything against him again. So this was literally her only way to retaliate, and she was ruthless in her pursuits to punish her husband indirectly. 
So Lido gathered her babies at her breast and she began to run. And so Apollo and Artemis spent their entire childhood on the run, hidden, taking kindness from strangers and other gods, anywhere they could find it. They were always, always just ahead of that large snake. And so they never really had a moment's peace. You can imagine what that does to a small child. And one day Zeus comes up and he decides to visit his children and he brings with him some gifts. And among those gifts is uh, our bows and arrows. And he basically hands them over and says, what are you gonna do with these new gifts? And Artemis looks at them and says, oh, sick. <laughs> I'm gonna head off on my own. I'm gonna find some hot ladies and we're gonna start a club. Uh, see you later. And then she headed out. And <laughs> that was basically the start of Artemis's wonderful life, right? She was like, listen, sucks to suck. I'll see you later. She didn't really spend a lot of time <laughs> with her mother and brother. Uh, after she got that bow and arrow, she was off to start her own life with all those hot ladies in the woods. Um, Apollo, however, saw this bow and arrow and he thought, what an excellent way to get rid of my mother's greatest problems. And of course, that greatest problem is the giant snake. So Apollo, a young teenager who's very cocky, he's very good looking, people are always singing his praises. They're saying, wow, Apollo, you're so capable. Apollo, you're so strong and fast and you're so good at sports. So he already had a pretty big ego and now he has a weapon, holy cow. So he uh, hunts down that snake. There is a crazy battle. Um, it's fierce and he's very heroic. So Apollo ends up killing that giant snake and basically having his moment of heroic glory. And that made him have a pretty big head. Uh, <laughs> So, as he's leaving from his conquest, he has that bow and arrow strapped to his back, and he ends up passing a little boy. And that little boy is playing with a tiny bow and arrow set, which honestly sounds adorable. Um, I would love to see it. Now, Apollo immediately decides to bully this child. I don't know why. Uh, feeling cocky, a shitty teenager. We know teenagers can be pretty shitty. So, <laughs> Apollo really did um make a mistake so he starts to make fun of this child he's saying look at you with your tiny bow and arrow you don't have one that was given to you by zeus oh my gosh your bow and arrow is a baby's bow and arrow set you can't hit anything with that i bet you can't even fire that you'll never be a great warrior like me i just killed the giant python that's been terrorizing my mom what have you done with your life tiny child and the little boy is listening to this, and he's like, I mean, why are you even talking to me? Um, you're a teenager. Why would you even feel like bullying a small child? And to that I say, that's a good point. But Apollo continues, and eventually the little boy kind of nods and says, All right, I guess I have to prove myself to you. And so he docks his arrow, he pulls it back, and he fires his tiny arrow directly into Apollo's heart. And Apollo gasps, and he steps back, and he clutches his chest. And then he realizes he's okay. In fact, he's more than okay. That, that arrow must have missed. He didn't feel it at all. And he throws his head back, and he laughs, and he says, Wow, you were literally firing directly at me, and you didn't hit me. How crazy is that? You're terrible at this. And then he goes on his way. But as he leaves, he starts to feel really strange. In fact... He starts to be really drawn to something. He can't figure it out. He can hear somebody singing, I suppose. He smells something, but something around him is really starting to bother him. And he looks down, and he happens to see a beautiful nymph playing amongst the flowers. And that nymph's name is Daphne, and she really is gorgeous. And she looks up, and she sees the god Apollo as well. And honestly, she might have been super into him. She, she might have seen him and thought, wow, that beautiful young god is staring at me. I'm so lucky. It's pretty on brand with the nymphs to have that reaction. But she didn't get the chance to make any decisions of her own because that little boy docked another arrow, a black arrow of hate. 
and he let it fly directly towards her heart. And once it struck her, as she stared at Apollo, she realized he, she was terrified of him. She was suddenly filled with hatred and fear. She was so upset. Everything in her screamed, run, run, this God is going to hurt you. And so she did, she began to run. Now this baby, I'm sure you are beginning to realize if you haven't already realized it, was no ordinary child. That was Eros, the God of love. The child who they decided to give basically a nuclear weapon. One of the most dangerous weapons in the entire pantheon of Greek mythology and Greek gods, he was given the arrows of love and the arrows of hate. And those arrows could make you do some pretty horrific things. And there really is no resisting them, though some have tried. And that's a story of Dionysus for a different day. Now Apollo, overcome by this drug that is now coursing through his system, he begins to chase Daphne, screaming at her, please wait, please, please stop and talk to me. I have to talk to you, please. I've never loved anyone else this way. I've never felt this way. And also the added bonus, Apollo is a teenager. So these are some pretty big emotions anyway. And Daphne runs and runs until she reaches the river. And she calls out to her father, who is a river god, and she says, Father, help me, please. I'm being chased. I'm scared. This god is going to take me. Please, father, I'll do anything. And her father hears her and thinks, you want help? Because I can kill you. And I'm sure she said, uh, Dad, that's not, you literally could just ask him to go away. And he's like, okay, I'll kill you. Don't worry. And her father turns her from a beautiful nymph into a laurel tree. And the reason why I say kill is because there is no turning Daphne back after this. Once she's turned into this tree, she will never be a nymph again. There's no way to change her back. She literally lost her life because Eros was feeling pretty pissy and wanted to prove himself. So Apollo reaches Daphne and he sinks to his knees because he doesn't know what just happened to him. He is absolutely baffled by what just occurred. And he's also heartbroken. He's feeling an emotion he has never felt in his entire, we'll say 15, 16 years of life. He is feeling a terrible, terrible loss. And he ends up gathering up some of her laurel leaves and he makes that into a symbol because he really believes I must have been so in love with her. It can't have been for nothing, can't have been fake. How everything I was feeling, it must have been real. He makes that into his symbol and he wears it always, and that's why you see Apollo with a laurel leaf. So it's a pretty sad story. The beautiful young nymph ends up losing her life. Apollo ends up knowing heartbreak for the first time, and of course is forever vilified, especially in a wonderful series, and this is a wonderful series, like Laura Olympus, um, Heart of Dark, Touch of Darkness. <laughs> I'm not saying he's not a wonderful villain, because he really is. He fits the bill with modern day villains. But it's a pretty sad story if you're looking at it from my point of view. Or Apollo's point of view. So, we're gonna flash forward. Apollo is amongst the mortals one day, and he happens to spot a beautiful young man named Hyacinthus. Hyacinthus. <laughs> Hyacinthus is an athlete, right? In fact, that's how Apollo kind of noticed him, is that Apollo was an athlete as well. He was really into sports and he was really good at them. Um, and Hyacinthus was wonderful at sports. He was athletic and he was funny and he was fast and strong. And Apollo looked at him, took one look at that face and just fell madly in love and thought, I have to talk to that boy. I have to say hi. And he walked up and he, shoot, he went ahead and he uh, tried to shoot a shot. And he basically asked the boy if he would like to play sports with him. And Hyacinthus said, absolutely, I would. No question, you're hot as hell. And they began to play together. And eventually that turned into a very loving relationship where they spent every single day together. They couldn't get enough of each other. These two boys were inseparable. And one of their favorite things to do was to go out, they would run together, and they would work out together, they would play in the sun and lay in the sun and just soak up as much time as they could. And one of their favorite things to do is Hyacinthus loved to challenge Apollo. He would give him something and say, 
throw this as hard and fast as you can. I want to see it disappear. Or pick up this extremely heavy thing that no mortal could possibly pick up. Or he would say, run as fast as you can, I want to race. And every time Apollo would laugh and he would say, are you not tired of this? I'm a god. I'm a literal god. Not a demigod either. either. A true god. My mother is Leto. My dad is Zeus. Like, you know that I have godlike strengths and abilities. And Hyacinthus would beg, please. I just like seeing you at your fastest. And Apollo would laugh and he would oblige every time. Couldn't help it. Anything Hyacinthus wanted, he got. And as they were basking in their new love, they didn't realize that another god had fallen in love with Hyacinthus as well. Zephyr, the god of the wind, who really never interacted with mortals that much that I can tell. He had been looking down and staring at Hyacinthus's beautiful face as well. Every day, all the time Hyacinthus spent outside, he had been falling madly in love as well. And when he saw Apollo, he was overcome with jealousy. And he would think to himself, oh, why does Apollo get everything he wants? Why does Apollo get all the praise for being so handsome and so strong and so fast? Why does he get the men that I want and the beautiful people that I love? He doesn't deserve it, does he? What has he done? Nothing. And for that reason, Zephyr, the wind god, decided, if I cannot have Hyacinthus, nobody, nobody should be able to have Hyacinthus. It's not fair. And one day, Apollo and Hyacinthus were out, and they were playing, and they were running, and they were laughing, enjoying their time together. And Hyacinthus handed Apollo a discus. It's kind of like a really hard frisbee. And he said, Apollo, throw this as hard and fast as you can. Throw it straight into the sky. And Apollo laughed, and he said, again, you're not tired of this yet? Are you sure? You know you're going to lose that discus. <laughs> We're going to have to replace it. And I sent this laughed and he said, I'm sure. I want to see it. And Apollo said, anything for you. Of course I will. And he picked up that discus and he flung it as hard and fast as he can. And it disappeared straight into the clouds up and away, riding on the wind until it was completely gone. And Hyacinthus laughed and he clapped and he kissed Apollo and he said, you're so capable, you're so strong, I'll never get tired of it. And they continued their play. But Zephyr turned the direction of the wind hard and fast so quickly nobody could prepare for it. All of a sudden the winds took that discus flying through the clouds and it pushed it in the other direction and suddenly it was flying hard and fast as faster than humanly possible straight back down towards where Hyacinthus was uh, running on the ground and it ended up hitting Hyacinthus directly in the head it broke his neck killing him instantly and Apollo at first wasn't sure what was happening. He was looking at his lover one moment, standing and laughing, and then suddenly the next moment he's lying on the ground. And the thing is, Apollo is the god of medicine. He's a healer. People beg him far and wide, please come and heal my lover. Please come and heal my child. And he can do it. He's so good at it. He's the god of medicine. He should be able to help this. So he got his Hyacinthus' body in his arms, and he begins to pour his magic into this boy. Everything he can think to do, he's pouring all of his magic into him. He's begging him, please come back. You're okay. You're all right, because I can fix you. I'm a god that can fix things. I wouldn't have these powers if they were meaningless. I wouldn't have all this magic if I couldn't fix you. That has to be our fate. Our fate is together. It's not apart. You don't die this young. But as much magic as he's pouring into him, he cannot heal something that is already gone. And so he runs up to Olympus, he flies as fast as he can, and he actually grabs the nectar of the gods. He grabs an entire cup of it. He says, it's okay, I'll make you a god. You'll be immortal, you'll never die. I can't believe I didn't do this already. I'm sorry, and I'll apologize when you come back that I didn't do this already, that you had to suffer this way. But 
you're gonna live forever. I'm gonna make sure of it. But he pours that entire skein of nectar down up the Hyacinthus's throat and nothing happens because you can't make immortal what is already gone, what is already dead. And so Apollo's last thought is to follow Hyacinthus down to the underworld. He goes down to the underworld, he crosses the river, and he requests a meeting with Hades. Now Hades, the god of the underworld, I assume already like, knew Apollo was gonna be on his way. He saw the arrival of the beautiful Hyacinthus, and he thought, oh, I better be ready, Apollo's gonna be here soon. He's not gonna take this lightly, and he was absolutely right. So when Apollo came to him, Hades said, listen, Apollo, nephew, I know what you're thinking, and I know what you're going to ask, and you know what my answer has to be. I cannot bring your lover back from the dead. It's not how it works. When it's their time to go, when the fates have decided that their strings are to be cut, that is it. There's no turning it back. You know this. You've been told this. You have to let him go. And Apollo said to him, I don't want you to bring him back to life. I understand, uncle, that you can't do that. I know the rules. I want you to take my life. I want you to make me mortal so I can die and I can be with the one I love. I want you to kill me because I don't want to spend a single day alive without Hyacinthus. And it took him off guard, but it was impossible. Hades could not take the life of another god. They were immortal, there's no way to do it. And as much as Apollo cried and pleaded and begged, there was nothing that could be done. So he was forced to kind of accept the fact that he was going to live forever and Hyacinthus was not. He went back to his body and he turned his lover into the Hyacinth flower. And on every petal, he wrote the words Al Al, which translates to Alas. He was literally writing his pain on the petals. And that is the story of Apollo and Hyacinthus. We got a little bit of headway on this shadow block. So basically what's gonna happen with this block, this is block number two. Block number one is right here. We have some line work. So you can see what they're gonna look like. I'm gonna get rid of these. Put them on this block. There will be four blocks in total, so we'll have four different colors. And I'm really looking forward to seeing that final print. If you liked this, please like and subscribe. If you want more videos like this, comment, let me know. What stories do you love? What do you want to know more about? I would love to tell them. And if you're not already following me on TikTok or Instagram or my Patreon, all of my uh, social media handles are down below. I hope you guys have a wonderful day. Be careful of that wind, it gets pretty treacherous. And I'll see you on another one.